Hi, and welcome back. We're going to do a quick little kind of recap on um, looking at the different groups that divided our nation over the war in Vietnam. And when we went through your guys' previous assignment, I had given you a concept question to think about. And the concept question was to contrast the political views of the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, the YAF, the Young Americans for Freedom, and the counterculture, and then tell me how you would explain the differences between these groups. As a quick reminder, SDS, or the Students for a Democratic Society, they very much called themselves the New Left, and they thought of themselves as the New Liberals of the 1960s. And they are a group that thought that society had become too materialistic and superficial, and a lot of that is a backlash to the consumerism of the 1950s. This group also thought that there needs to be more economic equality in the United States, and they did require what they called the creative and socialistic overhaul to spread wealth to all classes of people. And then ultimately remember that this group also wants an end to the Vietnam War, um, and wants to see the United States really kind of pull out of all wars of foreign aggression uh, that we don't need to be in. The counterculture or the hippies um, is that group that very much wanted to divorce themselves from the mainstream society entirely. They have a very, very different kind of alternative vision for how they're going to live in America. And a lot of that has to do with their physical experiences, which means that this is the group that does co connect themselves to the experimentation of drugs. And then also with like Woodstock and other things of the 1950s, they do very much kind of like live in this flower power, nice and, and rock and roll kind of society that's going on. In terms of your conservative kind of response and backlash to these liberal groups that have been created, I did introduce you guys to the Young Americans for Freedom. The Young Americans for Freedom, they definitely defend free enterprise and they defend the market economy. They also defended the war in Vietnam as kind of part of this, and they did kind of see these new left kind of groups that were coming up as being kind of like more detrimental to the United States than helping anything in any kind of way, shape, or form. This group also is going to have a faith in Christianity that's going to kind of exist, and they also also want to see the power within the federal government actually reduced and a little bit of the more power kind of kicked back to the states and in doing that um, they also want to see order and liberty or law and order kind of established back in the United States and one of the things that will kind of lead Nixon um, to winning the presidency by the end of the 1960s is going to be this group that's going to focus on reestablishing law and order in the United States and you'll really kind of see that 1968 will kind of push you towards that need um, for a president like Nixon to, to kind of win Americans over uh, in that election. You can also see here in some of the groups and some of the some of the pictures that I'm kind of flashing up here that, that this is a group that's going to support the war in Vietnam in a whole lot of ways. And they are going to see that this fight in Vietnam is very much like our patriotic duty um, lots of times. But the Young Americans for Freedom is that group that, that does support conservatism um, at this time when liberal groups are very much kind of going off. I also did give you guys a quick little introduction to some of the anti-war opposition that had to do with the draft. Just a quick reminder, the draft did start in 1969, and it was that lottery system that made it was supposed to have make it fair, but there were ways to get deferred from the draft. And while you did have um, a lot of people that were drafted, you did have 15 million Americans that did apply for and did receive a deferment. Most of those deferments that were done were by college kids, because if you were in college, you did get a draft deferment, means meaning that you didn't have to go into the draft while you were in college. And most of the people that can afford college are richer Americans. And so this did kind of make it so that you did have uh, more of the poor and uneducated people being drafted and you did have a lot of protests like the one that's up there that did kind of like draw attention to the fact that this was a rich man's war that was being fought by poor soldiers um, and a lot of whom were coming back in coffins instead of um, coming back to like their daily lives. You are going to see a lot of things that are going to kind of resist registering for the draft and you guys did get to see uh, Muhammad Ali um, or Cassius Clay. Um, who did go and protest the draft is kind of part of that. But here's a quick reminder of what U.S. troops kind of look like, and you can see the escalation of U.S. troops as they do kind of progress from 1965 all the way to 1973 when we do finally pull out. On the on the right-hand column, you're seeing the South Vietnamese troops, and you can see the commitment that the South Vietnamese kind of put up there in terms of their military resources while the United States was sending a lot of military resources as well. Uh, just a quick just kind of thing to show you some of the protests and some of the pictures pictures that did kind of exist because the 1960s was very much a time about protests and a lot of these protests did have to do with anti-war opposition. A lot of it was done by college kids, but you did have some older groups and older Americans that did protest as well, uh, like the Quakers on a religious level who were pacifists uh, did protest the war. Some of the protests were a little bit more dramatic in, in the way that they did kind of stage it, and this is kind of showing like... Um, 
people that are supposed to be laying there dead um, and kind of showing like how many people were going to be killed by U.S. bombs in Indochina. Um, and then this one that's kind of showing like the true power of flower power, but in a standoff between what looks to me like the National Guard um, and then some protesters, this guy's putting flowers um, in the barrels of the guns as kind of part of it. Uh, last thing I'm going to show you is just a quick little video clip that's going to kind of introduce you to some of the peace rallies and just kind of give you a quick look at some of the peace rallies that are here. The peace rallies that you're going to see are in New York, San Francisco, and then the last one that you're going to see is actually an international peace rally in Rome that's outside of the U.S. Embassy. Um, I'm sorry about the timestamps and the fact that it's stock footage, um, but you're just going to have to deal with it. protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. Central Park is the starting point for the parade to the U.N. building. The estimated 125,000 Manhattan marchers include students, housewives, beatnik poets, doctors, businessmen, teachers, priests, and nuns. Makeup and costumes were bizarre. <laughs> Before the parade, mass draft card burning was urged. Demonstrators claimed 200 cards were burned, but no accurate count could be determined. Reporters and onlookers were jostled away on purpose. Although mostly peaceful, shouted confrontations were frequent and fiery during the course of the march. The anti-war marchers were picketed by anti-anti-war marchers who were hawkish toward the parading doves. Rights leader Martin Luther King leads the procession to the United Nations where he urges UN pressure to force the US to stop bombing North Vietnam. Police arrested five persons as disorderly. Three were grabbed when they rushed the parade float. No serious injuries, however, in New York's biggest anti-war mark. A companion peace demonstration brings out 50,000 marchers in downtown San Francisco. They parade two miles along Market Street, pacifists and hippies together. Gigantic Kesar Stadium holds the mass rally, where anti-war songs and speeches trigger a short scuffle between pro and con factions. No one was injured. Both demonstrations were sponsored by a loose coalition of left-wing, pacifist and moderate anti-war groups. President Johnson, meanwhile, let it be known that the FBI is closely watching all anti-war activity. In Rome, a peace demonstration ironically erupts into violence near the U.S. Embassy along the glamorous Via Veneto. The police, alerted to possible trouble, stopped the marchers just short of their goal, and then the march turned into a riot. Peace placards, cafe chairs, and fists flew in all directions. The next phase, a sit-down protest, but Rome police and firemen, too, had a solution. A solution, H2O, applied freely and under high pressure by the Rome Fire Brigade. The strong water jets bowled over demonstrators one after another. They dried out in the pokey. It took police one hour to break up the mob. 33 rioters were arrested. Internal drama in the eternal city. All right, last thing you guys have to go do is go back and answer your concept question. Um, the concept question was to contrast the political views of the SDS, the YAF, and the counterculture, and tell me how you would explain the differences between the groups. Thanks for listening.